So we're going to run through. I, I started out, I had about 20 slides that all had all the data from all the studies on them. And I was so bored looking through it myself that I decided you guys can look up those, those, uh, those trial information if you like. Um, my only disclosure is I did serve on a Boston Scientific Advisory Board, but I gave all the money away to educational aspects. Um, so uh, transcatheter uh, valves, uh, as the name denotes, are valves that are fixed on a catheter. Um, there, are two main, there are two main type. There's uh, balloon expandable and self-expanding valves. The uh, balloon expandable valves uh, um, are mounted on the stent and they're actually opened up by inflating a balloon inside of it, uh, increasing the radial pressure and pushing the obstructed valve out of the way. The uh, self-expanding stents are loaded on with a nitinol cage and as you release the valve out of the, uh, out of the catheter, it will retain its, uh, its shape within the, within the temperature, high temperature of the blood flow. Um, there are also kind of combinations of uh, self-expanding uh, with mechanical support. Um, so the reason for transcatheter valves uh, is really, it kind of sprung from the invasiveness of the uh, aortic valve operation and, and is there an easier way? Is there a way of, uh, of doing it safer? Um, if you look at the uh, STS uh, predicted um, risk of, of operative mortality, um, if, you have a, if you're in the low risk uh, category of less than 5% and you get an isolated AVR, you have pretty good outcomes. Um, by the time you get into higher risk, if you're over 5% uh, predicted risk of mortality, the actual mortality rate in the STS database is up to 10%. And if you're in the 10% uh, predicted risk, your estimated risk is uh, up to 17%. So as, as your risks are mounting, uh, some of the outcomes become a little bit uh, less predictable. And we know that, uh, that in the early trials of, of uh, TAVR versus uh, whatever medical therapy you can think of for aortic stenosis, um, which isn't much, uh, in the patients who are extreme risk and could not undergo surgery, uh, those patients did much better with TAVR than they did with, uh, with sending them to hospice or whatever you do for patients with uh, that degree of severe AS and symptoms. Um, so uh, that showed that TAVR was feasible and it could be done in, in extreme risk patients. Um, the other trials uh, have been, several other trials have been done and I'm going to kind of summarize the results. The uh, trials have really shown that uh, in patients who are high risk for surgery, meaning an STS risk of greater than 8% or frailty or, or other reasons that they're high risk for uh, aortic valve replacement, uh, those patients um, actually in, in some studies did a little bit better with TAVR and other, in other studies there was uh, non-inferiority. And so the FDA approved both the core valve and the, Sap and the uh, Edward Sapien valve uh, for use in patients who are at high risk uh, for AVR. Uh, and that high risk was deemed by a heart team with two cardiac surgeons and one cardiologist. Um, over time, the, uh, the results have gotten better, the, uh, saf the safety margin has gotten better, and uh, the uh, FDA approval uh, for intermediate risk was based on, uh, on two studies, one, one major study, the Sirtavi trial on, uh, with core valve, and uh, the other trial with, uh, with the Sapien valve uh, got uh, FDA approval for the Sapien valve and the core valve uh, approval is, is uh, right around the corner. So uh, the, the valve has been approved for intermediate risk, um, but at the same time we still see some problems with, uh, with transcatheter valves that we don't see uh, with AVR. One of those problems is, uh, is a paravibular leak. And some of the early trials had a lot of paravibular leak. The more recent trials uh, have much less. And you can see here that uh, comparing TAVR, uh, TAVR to, to surgical valve replacement, um, there's a higher rate of mild paravibular leak. The, and there's also a, a significant uh, rate of moderate paravibular leak. Um, but as the, uh, as the years go on, the, the level of mild leak is, uh, it gets a little bit better with some of the valves. Um, in the trials that, uh, the early trials, um, there were a lot of uh, technical aspects that uh, 
patients would leave the OR with mild to moderate perivivir leak that these days probably would not be leaving uh, with that degree of leak. And uh, in the, uh, now with the third generation of uh, core valve and the third generation of sapien valve, uh, the perivivir leak rates have gone way down. Um, this is the, these are the sapien device. Uh, this was the original uh, sapien valve, which wa was delivered in a 22 to 24 French uh, sheath. And very few patients were actually had the capacity to have that sheath uh, brought around their iliac arteries. So we ended up doing a lot of these transapical. Um, and that had a lot of uh, increased uh, morbidity to that. Uh, the Edward Sapien XT came out, and that had uh, a smaller sheath. And then the Sapien 3 that actually has a cuff of, uh, of tissue around the, uh, the base. And that uh, actually will uh, kind of infold into the, um, into the irregularities of the calcified a aortic valve. Uh, and the rates of paravalvular leak are much lower with the third generation. Uh, also, the, uh, okay. also, the uh, sheath size has gotten much better. Um, there's uh, several uh, valves that are in clinical trials right now. I'm not, I'm not going to name all of them, but um, uh, this, this, uh, the portico valve has uh, a different uh, design that uh, hopefully will decrease the rate of uh, pacemaker insertion. The original core valve uh, had a very high rate of pacemaker insertions. Uh, now, as we're learning more about where to put these valves, that uh, rate is coming down. And um, the pacemaker rate with the core valve, with the uh, self-expanding valves is anywhere from uh, 15 to 24 uh, percent. And it's heading, trending down uh, closer to the 15 percent range now. With the balloon expandable valves, it's more on the, on the range of 8 to 10 percent. You can see here with, with uh, Several design changes. The paravalvular leak rate has come down. This is the Sapien 3 with a 3% uh, um, risk of, uh, having, um, uh, of having moderate or severe paravalvular leak. And then the direct flow and the Lotus valves uh, have even uh, down to single digit uh, levels of moderate to severe paravalvular leak. Typically, we try not to leave the OR if we have uh, moderate or severe paravalvular leak. Um, and this, this is just showing some of the, uh, the valves um, the, on the market and some of them under clinical trials right now uh, and their delivery systems. Percutaneous closure, uh, due, because the, uh, the delivery systems have gotten smaller, the sheaths have gotten smaller, we've gotten away from, uh, tra from transapical access uh, and we've been able to do percutaneous closure allowing uh, patients to get through this procedure without being intubated, which is somewhat is nice for the, some of the sicker patients. Uh, the TAVR risks are improving uh, the technology. Uh, the valve design allows for delivery with a smaller sheath. Uh, the percutaneous access and closure is better than it was before. Um, we can avoid alternative access more, more often. And um, the newer balloon and marker designs make, a, make for a more stable deployment. Uh, if you've ever seen the ST, uh, if you've ever seen the S3 deployed as opposed to the original Sapien, the original Sapien, we always talked about riding it like a bucking bronco. Even when you're rapidly pacing, you ride that thing in and out of the valve as you're inflating it. The, uh, the S3 inflates just like that and you never, you never see it budge. So uh, the deployment is much better. There are, there are more flexible delivery catheters, so you have less uh, injury to the, to the vessels and uh, new retrievable devices, which uh, by being able to readjust your position even after you've deployed the valve, um, it will really decrease the rate of paravalvular leak and decrease the pacemaker insertion rate. So um, is it safe to offer it to low-risk patients? Bottom line, uh, say a lot of things here, but not yet. Uh, we, I, don't, I, don't, I think it's reasonable to put them through a clinical trial as long as they're uh, under a very informed consent, uh, but I don't think it's ready for uh, widespread use in low-risk patients yet. Um, some of the questions about TAVR safety, uh, paravalvular leak, uh, much more rare now. Uh, rarely do we have more than mild. The permanent pacemaker rate we talked about, vascular injuries are much more rare with the, with the sheaths we have. Stroke rate is 1 to 7 percent, and in mo most studies it's actually equivalent or maybe a little better than surgical AVR. Uh, 
um, valve embolization, aortic dissection, annulus rupture, LV perforation, coronary obstruction are all rare. But if you ever get one of those, you wish you'd never gone into a TAVR room. Um, so those are pretty significant problems. And the big problem is the durability isn't known yet. So you can see here the, the TAVR valve in the root here and the uh, new dissection uh, that we found in the cath lab. And uh, that's no, no fun to find. Uh, this was a um, valve that we had deployed and then all of a sudden uh, you can hear the Halloween music in the background as this thing starts coming down on the echo and you can see the valve plop down right into the ventricle and if, if that ever happens uh, the most important thing is don't freak out and pull the wire out so you want to leave the wire in because um, you can see here there's another valve deployed right here and we stuck two Surratts in through the apex and uh, crunched up that valve uh, just blindly sort of under fluoro. I had two, two uh, Surratt clamps and just kind of crushed, crunched it up and pulled it out and we had already deployed a second valve in and because we had that wire in it didn't flip over and, and cause the patient to die suddenly. So this uh, shows, I don't know if you can see it well, but there's a pretty big paravalvular leak here and that's kind of been sort of the Achilles heel here. So questions do remain about the durability that won't be clear for some time. We've, we're in the third generation now, so we're only eight, eight years into follow-up data from the first generation valves, and those were all done in extreme risk patients. So that's not gonna tell us much about degenera de degeneration rates. Um, PVL and vascular complications have greatly improved. We have to continue to scrutinize the outcomes and anticipate the setbacks while moving forward with new innovations. So thank you very much.